Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 47 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Dr. Nicola McFadzian Ducharme, and the topic of the show is Lyme Ed. Dr. Nicola McFadzian Ducharme is the founder and medical director of Restore Medicine. She practices holistic medicine specializing in Lyme disease, hormone balancing, autistic spectrum disorders, preconception healthcare, and digestive disorders. Dr. Nicola is a licensed naturopathic doctor trained in both the United States and in her native country of Australia. She received her doctorate in naturopathic medicine from Bastyr University in Seattle, Washington, and her Bachelor of Health Sciences from the University of New England in New South Wales, Australia. Her training included a two-year internship at the Bastyr Center for Natural Health, an internship in medical research at Columbia University as a Mountbatten Scholar, and four years at the Bastyr University Research Institute. Dr. Nicola is a medical advisor to the Lyme Disease Association of Australia. She is a referral doctor for Defeat Autism Now and is an outreach physician for Great Plains Laboratory. She is a consultant for New Beginnings Nutritionals and is on the Scientific Advisory Board for Hyperbaric Oxygen Centers Incorporated and the Medical Advisory Board of the Institute for Integrative Medicine. She is a member of the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, the California Naturopathic Doctors Association, and the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians. Dr. Nicola is a published author with her own books, Beginner's Guide to Lyme Disease, Lyme Disease in Australia, The Lyme Diet, Nutritional Strategies for Healing from Lyme Disease, Lyme Brain, as well as a chapter in Connie Strassheim's books, Insights into Lyme Disease Treatment, 13 Lyme Literate Healthcare Practitioners Share Their Healing Strategies, and New Paradigms in Lyme Disease Treatment, 10 Top Doctors Reveal Healing Strategies That Work. And now my interview with Dr. Nicola McFadzian Ducharme. Dr. Nicola maintains a busy practice in San Diego, California, has written several books on Lyme disease and just released several online courses on how to recover from Lyme disease. It's amazing that she has the time to do it all. Welcome to the show, Dr. Nicola. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Yeah, awesome. So tell us a little bit about how you got involved with Lyme disease and was it based on some personal experience with your own health? Yeah, actually not. Um, Not at all. I was working with uh, an autism doc and he was training me in that work um, when I first came to San Diego in 2003. And so I did that for a couple of years and then started treating the moms of some of these kids that we had in our practice. And they were, you know, coming in in their sort of early 30s, mid 30s with chronic fatigue and everything hurts and I can't sleep and what's going on. So I, you know, practicing functional medicine, started doing a workup on them and Lyme was one of the things I tested for and it it kept coming up positive and sort of from there it was just, you know, it just kind of grew and snowballed. There aren't that many Lyme practitioners in Southern California and so I got busy with that pretty quickly and that's, that's been my practice since. So I know you work with very complex cases. What do you think are the three kind of top things that stand out in your mind in terms of having the most negative impact on a person's health, and then maybe the three things that are the treatments or the things that are potentially beneficial that really are resonating with you right now? Yeah, well, I mean, I so for three things that are the most stressful on the system, I mean, you know, the, the ongoing infection, certainly, and I think what we're learning now, what we're kind of discovering is it's not just Lyme and co-infections, you know, there's this myriad of viral issues and parasitic issues and so that's one of the things that I think is, you know, is one of the stressors, especially with, you know, parasites and other mycoplasma and other pathogens that we may not really have adequate testing for at this point. Um, mold, I absolutely think is is right up on the top of the list. Um, 
And then I would actually put, you know, nutritional stress there. I mean, there's, there is so much that comes of, you know, what we put in our bodies and, and how we're addressing our health with our own nutrition. So I think if those factors aren't being addressed, then, then that can be a really big stressor as well. Um, and then treatments I'm resonating with. So, I, you know, I still love my herbs and herbal medicines. I've always been, you know, really big on that. Um, I'm realizing the power of ozone therapy. We've started doing ozone in the practice, um, but also kind of looking more at, you know, patients being able to do rectal ozone and other kinds of ozone themselves at home. Um, and we're also researching stem cells right now and, and looking at introducing stem cell therapy in the practice. Cool. I need to come down to your office. <laughs> that sounds, <laughs> sounds great. So talk to us a little bit about your perspective between chronic Lyme disease, persistent Lyme disease, post-Lyme syndrome. We hear all these terms. So what are they? Do you think that there, if there are still symptoms, do you think that there is a persistence of infection or is it possible that we've eradicated all of these bugs and we just have more of an autoimmune driven uh, remaining symptoms really being more autoimmune driven? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. And I do feel there are some people where Lyme does become an autoimmune issue. And so there are some cases where I think the immune modulation and just looking at trying to balance that is, you know, one of the primary things. Um, I think chronic Lyme versus persistent Lyme, I mean, obviously there's overlap there. Chronic Lyme, in my view, is just sort of really anything. I mean, if I went by Boriscano's definition, it's anything beyond a year. But I almost think that once you're outside of that acute first few weeks kind of window, then you know, it's a gray area from that point on. Um, persistent Lyme, in my view, is is the continuation of infection beyond, like despite treatment. You know, it's like we're doing everything in our power and you would imagine that no bacteria on the planet could survive some of the protocols that these patients are doing and yet there seems to be ongoing infection. And that can be validated by PCR testing and whatnot too. So, um, you know, it, it's tricky because... I do think that a lot of the time it is some degree of ongoing infection or persistent infection. But like I said before, there's so many complicating factors of parasites and viruses and, and all of this kind of thing. And then when we're looking at Borrelia itself, you know, the cyst forms, what's stuck in the biofilm, you know, there's, there's different factors just looking at the Lyme bacteria too. So that's a good lead into my next question, which is what makes Lyme disease so complicated to treat? It doesn't seem like there's that many conditions that are as complex and multifactorial and multiple layers as Lyme disease. So what are some of those complicating factors that makes it difficult for you as a clinician to treat? Yeah, well, great question. So, I mean, I think it's the fact that Lyme can really unravel so many different functions and different systems within the body. So it's not like we're just treating a bacterial infection, kill off the bacteria and live happily ever after. I mean, it's the, the, the ramifications to the body in terms of, you know, the stress on the adrenals, in terms of um, just the secondary effects, imbalances in neurotransmitters, the inflammatory cascade and the impact of that, the, the, the interaction with the microbiome and how that then affects the patient, whether or not they're taking antibiotics, which, you know, are just different levels. Um, so I think it's just that it's so multifaceted and it's some elements, it's a little hard to know what's the chicken and what's the egg, right? So is Lyme causing all of this kind of destruction in the body or how much is it that the person had certain genetic factors, methylation factors, whatever the case may be that, predisposes them to not only having the infection, but then having the degree of dysregulation in the immune system. Because I test some of the spouses of my patients or partners of my patients, and they can come up positive too, but they may not have any symptoms. Right. So there's clearly something that unravels some people and not others. It is a complicated web, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. So when you are working with someone that potentially has Lyme, tell us a little bit about some of the labs you might use to look for Lyme disease and Lyme-related co-infections. What are your favorites right now? Well, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of digging this DNA connections. Um, I still use Hygienix. I love their Western blot. Um, the IFA and the Western blot, absolutely, I still do through Hygienix. Um, the co-infection testing for me has always been sort of fraught with issues just in terms of false negatives and 
So I've it's historically done most of my co-infection investigation just through clinical presentation. And then I do what's called a co-infection provocation that gives me a lot of information about that. And I can touch on that in a minute if you would like. But now with the DNA connections, I feel like that's giving a little bit greater sensitivity for the co-infections. Uh, nothing's 100%. I had a patient the other day that, I mean, without a shadow of a doubt, they have Babesia and it didn't show up on the DNA connections. But I do like that it is a PCR. So if something shows up, I mean, you know, there's evidence of the DNA of the bacteria in the urine sample. So I feel like it's a little bit less um, conflicting than some of the, you know, the, the indirect tests, which are measuring immune response. And are you, with the DNA connections testing, are you doing some type of provocation prior to the urine collection as well? Yeah. So I'm having people, so I think the guideline is like half an hour of intensive exercise, which I feel is ironic for a Lyme test, right. but um, <laughs> <laughs> at least like a deep tissue massage or something like that, unless the patient knows that that would really flare them up. Um, for sure, I always try and do something to sort of provoke it. Nice. Perfect. So what is your perspective on treating Lyme with either antibiotics versus natural therapies, like you mentioned, herbs or potentially essential oils? How often do you do just one versus the other? How often do you combine them? And do you think that people can get well without the use of antibiotics? So that's the million dollar question. I mean, I do think people can get well without antibiotics, but I'm a firm believer that they need to adopt a sort of multi-modality approach. So what I have been kind of leaning towards more in my practice is still doing some antibiotic therapy, especially earlier on in the piece, but trying to move away from antibiotics as soon as possible and then transitioning over to something natural. So I've always said, and I still, I still would say, I know others would disagree with me, that I don't see people getting well just with herbs. I, I just don't see it. Um, and I have a lot of people who've come to me having done months of certain herbal protocols. And it's just hard, I think, to get all the way there. I mean, I think herbs combined with good nutrition, combined with rife therapy or ozone therapy or, you know, just a combination of these things, I think, can get people there. Um, but I, you know, oftentimes when I'm working with folks, I do still do antibiotic therapy in conjunction with herbs and nutritional supplements and support and IV nutrients if they can. And I mean, as many different factors as we can bring in, um, or as many tools as we can employ, but I have found essential oils, especially, I mean, they're very powerful and very potent. So I have found since I've been utilizing those that I can get people off antibiotics sooner. So now my aim with antibiotics is sort of more like six to eight months, which I still know is a long time, but as opposed to two years, um, give it a good burst, try and knock that microbial load down and then be working on the immune system and lowering inflammation along the way. And while trying to protect the gut and the liver and all the, you know, proactive stuff that we do there and then try and get them shifted into a more natural. But once the microbial load is, you know, knocked down a little bit, I feel like we have better success. Yeah. And I think what I took away from what you just said is that with Lyme, whether it's herbs or antibiotics or other things, that there's always several tools that it takes to really make progress, whatever those tools Absolutely. are, that it's never just one tool. Yeah. So let's, let's and talk, I think a yeah. lot of those things, sorry to interrupt you, Scott, but no. I think a lot of those things are things that people can do themselves at home. I know some, there's a sort of um, a belief perhaps, and I think there's a little bit of truth to um, you know, the financial stressors of treating Lyme and not everybody can go and do, you know, 10 plus ozone and IVs every week and, 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 and that's just not available to everybody. But I think there are a lot of simple things that, that people can do at home that don't cost a lot of money um, that they don't even really, they can do on their own without even having a doctor to oversee it. So I think um, that's an important fact to remember too, of just all the little bits and pieces that people can do in their day-to-day lives to their, you know, to their functional capacity would, would be helpful. So as we kind of go through the rest of the questions for the show, let's try to weave those in because that's actually one of the things I get from people a lot in terms of feedback on the podcast is, 
lots of these things are great, but can we focus on things people can do that are low cost? So I actually am going to sure. bring that into the next question as well. But if there's other places, I think that actually is really empowering for people and really actionable. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little about the importance of detoxification. How important is it for us to get toxins out of the body? What are some of the toxins that you think impact people with Lyme the most? Why does detoxification matter at all? Um, and then are there some specific things that you really like for detox? And then let's weave in some of the at-home support tools that potentially can be helpful as well. Sure, yeah. You know, I think detox is sort of way, you know, way, way, way up on the list of the priorities, high on the list of priorities. Um, and in fact, as we'll talk more about the course, but in my online course, I actually put the detoxification module first before any of the naturopathic, before talking about herbs, before antimicrobials, before, before anything, detoxification first. And that is something that, you know, when I'm working with a patient for the first time, it will typically be in the very first treatment plan is making sure we're addressing detoxification. So I do think, um, I mean, obviously when you're treating Lyme and killing off bacteria and other kinds of pathogens, there are sort of toxins released in that process um, that then the body needs to deal with. So that's, you know, the classic Herxheimer reaction. And that is really crucial, but there are other kinds of toxins too, like candida, for example, sort of creates toxins of its own. There can be, you know, aldehydes, there can be ammonia in the body. And those things can really mess with the brain and make the brain very foggy and make people feel like very spaced out or like they've, you know, drunk half a bottle of wine. Um, and then there's the other toxins like heavy metals, mycotoxins, things like that, that might require kind of bigger and more substantial treatment plans. So there's a few different levels there, but also just toxins that we get from our food, from our water. Um, and, you know, in that sense, prevention is key. The more people can choose organic food, the more people are making sure all their water is filtered um, and just not taking those toxins in. And again, that that comes back to what can people do that they don't have to see a doctor for or cost money. You know, don't eat toxins, don't drink toxins. The air air quality and everything else can be tricky, but if it's within the budget, get an air purifier and filter filtration machine. Um, and just simple things like that, little things all the time. I would say EMFs are really showing up as quite a big deal. So that can sort of act as a toxin too, even though it's not something we're ingesting, um, that can lead to more of a toxic environment. And I think if people can pay attention to shutting down the phone, don't put the phone by the bed, you know, get, turn off the Wi-Fi, turn off the Bluetooth um, and just minimize those exposures, that can go a long way as well. What are your thoughts on things like coffee enemas as home tools? Is that something that your patients find helpful? Love, love, love. So I, I believe at this point, coffee enemas are the single most helpful thing people can do to help their detox, especially when they're feeling rubbish. So um, the nice thing about coffee enemas, I have had a couple of people who come back and say, I did a coffee enema and I felt worse. I had a headache. I was so tired. But that's the minority. I mean, for the most part, coffee enemas give pretty immediate relief. Um, and they, they're pretty consistently helpful. So coffee enemas are really up there now as probably my top recommendation for people to do at home. Um, Epsom salts baths, certainly I still find to be very helpful. Some people just need to tone down the temperature. For some people, it's just a heat sensitivity. Um, and so sometimes a lukewarm bath with Epsom salts is just as good. And the nice thing is you can put essential oils and, um, you know, Himalayan sea salts and other things in there to, to kind of make it nice too. Um, so that's one thing. Dry skin brushing, I would say, is another one. Um, again, you can get a soft bristle dry skin brush for eight or ten dollars at a health food store on Amazon. Um, and that's very good for the lymphatic system. You know, for all we talk about detox and Lyme treatment, I feel like the poor lymph system gets a little bit left out. Um, and the lymph system is really kind of like the waste management system of the body. And it brings sort of wastes and uh, metabolic waste and toxins and things from the periphery back into the central circulation where they can be really excreted from the body. And the lymph system is dependent on muscle contraction. It doesn't have a pump like the heart to pump the blood. 
Um, so the skin brushing just really helps sweep the lymphatic channels and sweep towards the periphery, towards the, excuse me, away from the periphery, towards the center of the body. And that can be a great thing to do a couple of times a day. So that's that's another one of my things too. Yeah, those are great tools. And I will say coffee enemas over the years was the thing that helped me the most in terms of like inflammation and pain and just feeling poorly. Fortunately, I don't do them all that often anymore. But if I go, you know, travel somewhere, stay in a hotel that seemed moldy, maybe start to feel like I'm getting a cold or a flu or was around sick people, something like that. That's kind of one of the first things I go to. And it's it's pretty amazing how well it seems to work. I, I know. I mean, people just swear by it. And I actually have, you know, a, a good number of patients for whom that was a turning point. The other thing I think about coffee enemas is it sort of helps to clear the candida. It helps to clear some of the parasites and get some of the, you know, clear some of the biofilm and, you know, all of this other stuff. It just really helps to cleanse the bowel as well as causing that sort of liver detox. Nice. So let's talk then about some of the tools that you use when you're approaching the Lyme and co-infection type pathogens, how you're treating them naturopathically. How do you manage these microbial overgrowths? Yeah, um, well, I still do a lot of herbs. I mean, I've always loved herbs, you know, as antimicrobials. Um, So I'll do a combination. I will often do herbs along with some kind of medication, antibiotics or antimalarials or whatnot, what I try and do is just minimize the amount of medication that I give. So sometimes I can use essential oils and feel like that's cleaning up the bacterial part. But Babesia, for example, may be, you know, stubborn and persistent. So maybe sometimes I'll pull in, you know, one medication, like just a malarone or an alinea for Babesia, and then try and utilize the herbs and essential oils to, to knock down the bacteria. So it's just a kind of... a a combination depending on what co-infections seem to be kind of dominant. But so yeah, I use single herbs. I use tinctures in combination. Um, my Lyme support formula, for example, you know, has some cat's claw and guaiacum, which are antispirochete. It has olive leaf extract, which is sort of anti-everything and immune supportive. And then it has the andrographis and Japanese knotweed as more of the sort of supportive anti-inflammatories. Um, and other herbs like teasel root and artemisinin and hetunia and things like that can be very helpful. And, and we didn't really talk about that, but as I understand, you've actually formulated a line of products to kind of address a lot of these different issues with your patients, whether it's Lyme or co-infections or viruses, parasites, detox. Maybe you could just tell us a little about that because I think that's sure. a great tool Yeah, yeah. So I, I do have a line of herbs that, um, that sort of do have uh, benefits for all these different things. So I have an adrenal tonic, I have an anti-inflammatory formula, I have a brain support formula that's more about like neurological healing and and support. Um, my antiviral formula is amazing. And it's just a combination of Melissa and Lorea Tridentata, which are two herbs that are really specific for the herpes family of viruses. So that's CMV and Epstein-Barr and HHV6 and, and all of those bad boys. And then... Um, I've got a great anti-parasite formula that I use a lot because, you know, parasites are showing up more and more as, as a sort of bigger issue. Um, so yeah, just all my favorites. I get to formulate them. I've got a detox support formula for those who do take Mepron and Malarone and one for those who don't because of the milk Mm. thistle component. Right. Um, and that's been really fun putting those together. I love that. And those are available for people through your website. I believe if they're interested, Yeah, we have an online store through restore medicine. Um, and we have an online store that people can get them. So no talk about microbes would be complete without a talk about biofilms. So how important is it to address biofilms? Is it something that you think has to be done for every patient? Are there certain patients where it really is more of a focus, but maybe not for others? And do some people recover without ever addressing biofilms? I do biofilm stuff in pretty much all my patients. I just don't necessarily do it right in the beginning. So my theory on that is, you know, if we're starting antimicrobial therapy, whatever that, however that may look, um, then there can be sort of this level of herxing that comes with just killing off whatever pathogens are sort of readily available to be killed off. Um, and so I always try and get people through that first before then trying to get to the deeper layers using biofilm agents. So I typically use a combination Um, lumbar kinase would be my favorite. There's a product that I like called interphase plus. It's a slightly different blend and it actually, so I often use those in combination if I feel biofilm is a big deal. Um, but that's where I think the coffee enemas are helpful too. Um, just 
when we are sort of breaking down biofilm and also biofilms in the, the gut that are produced by candida, um, then the coffee enemas are good to help clear some of that stuff. Um, the other product I love for biofilm, and it has crossover into Lyme treatment, is Biocidin by Biobotanical. Mm. Um, that's a really good one too. And then I've started using some stevia based on some of the, the sort of late, latest research. Um, I, and I mean, I see that to be somewhat helpful too. I feel like the lumbar kinase is still my number one. I do see people have, you know, this whole other sort of level of hoaxing potentially when they start that. So biocidin is um, one that I love and personally have used for like 20 years, way back before I ever even knew I had Lyme. It was on the scene for more for GI dysbiosis and parasites. I mean, it's been around for a long time. And in fact, I'm going to do a podcast um, very soon with the creator of that, Rachel Fresco, who I think you know as well. I do know Um, Rachel, yes. So yeah. And so let's talk about a little more around your thoughts and observations with stevia. So that one's a little bit controversial on the internet um, in terms of whether or not it actually works. I'm sure you've seen some of that where people say, well, but that research was just done in a dish and it wasn't really in people. My observation has been that people do have Herxheimer reactions when they uh, incorporate something like stevia. What do you find in terms of reactions to stevia? I have found that too. Um... Not all the time, but sometimes. I mean, enough to make me think it's doing something. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So pain and inflammation, we touched on a little bit. Those, I think, are really common issues in people with Lyme. What do you see as the drivers of the pain and inflammation? And then what are some of the triggers that you work on removing to minimize those symptoms? Yeah, I mean, I think inflammation is sort of just, you know, it's it's sort of a, a necessary part of immune response. I mean, it's an inherent part of immune response and it's, and by design, you know, inflammation in an acute setting is, is very important for uh, acute tissue injury and things like that. So I think what we have in Lyme is sort of inflammation gone awry, but just because it's so chronic and it's so ongoing. And um, so I do see the sort of inflammatory cascade as, as being quite a big contributor to pain Um but I think toxins contribute to pain. I think people's neurotransmitter imbalances contribute to pain too. Um, and I find people who are low in serotonin and, you know, if their norepinephrine dopamine pathway is off, that can, that can kind of play in too. So I think that the pain issue is like hypersensitivity of the nervous system. It can be toxins affecting the tissue, like certainly with, you know, toxic metals and things like that. Um, it can just come from the inflammation that's secondary from the immune response from the infection itself. Um, so I think there's a few different drivers there. So what are some of the things that you find? Are there maybe a top two or three anti-inflammatory pain reducing interventions that you find help your patients? Coffee enemas. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No. And, and that's true. Actually for me, I mean, I had tried, this was years ago when I was having a lot of pain and had tried everything, uh, all the herbs, all the supplements, I mean, pretty much anything I could come up with. And that was the only thing that I ever felt made a big difference. So sure. yeah, that's, yeah. that's true. So yeah, I mean, I do love the the anti-inflammatory herbs like white willow and curcumin, certainly. Um, the proteolytic enzymes I have used, I don't have as good success with them um, as I do the herbal anti-inflammatories. But I've also had pretty good results with low-dose naltrexone. And I feel like as an immune modulator, that helps to calm the inflammatory cascade. Uh, It's a little hit and miss. Not everybody benefits, but the people who do benefit really like it. And it seems to make a a big difference. And I think that's not only helping with the immune regulation, but it's also helping with the endorphin production in the brain. And so um, that's giving a little bit of a pain management effect too. Perfect. So some of the other more common complaints that I've heard from people are fatigue, cognitive issues, and sleep problems. So let's maybe break down each one of those. Let's talk about some of the tools you find helpful and what you see as potential causes of each of them. So let's start with fatigue. When someone comes in and they say fatigue is their number one thing, why are people so tired? What do you explore? And then what are some potential things to help with fatigue? Yeah, I mean, a certain amount of just goes with the territory when you have an infection. You know, even if you have a cold or a flu or something, fatigue is usually the first thing to happen. But I think in the in the context of chronic Lyme, other than just, you know, treat the infections to try and get through the other side, um, we want to look at mitochondrial support. 
um, because I think the mitochondria do often get kind of dysfunctional in that chronic illness picture. Um, So things like, you know, NT factor, coenzyme Q10, some of those sort of more mitochondrial agents, NADH, um, and then also looking at the hormonal a- aspect. So adrenal certainly and thyroid would be the, the two primary, um, but also reproductive hormones too. I mean, low testosterone in men and, and also in women can cause pretty profound fatigue. So I definitely want to look at those channels and see, you know, what's cortisol looking like, um, what's thyroid function looking like, what are the reproductive hormones looking like, and just try and see what clues we can get from that. Um, And so in terms of helping with energy, you usually a combination of those. One of my very, very favorite products is Energy Multiplex by Research Nutritionals because it has some adrenal support and some mitochondrial support. Beautiful. Um, Yeah. So the next one, I know we could, um, for more detail, refer people to your book, Lime Brain, but let's talk a little about cognitive issues and brain fog and memory and all of those things. What can we do to improve our cognitive capacity when we're dealing with something like Lyme disease? Yeah. Well, I find trying to reduce inflammation whichever way, because, you know, when we look at why cognitive issues happen, um, again, you know, bottom line, treat the infection, get the infection down to get the, the cognitive function back. In particular, working with things across the blood-brain barrier. I mean, that's so important to to look at the medications. If one is doing antibiotics, you know, tinidazole, alinea, uh, bicillin, rocephin. I mean, the medications focus on those that do cross the blood-brain barrier better, minocycline to some extent. Um, But also looking at reducing inflammation because a lot of brain fog is sort of inflammatory. Um, So all the things that we just touched on. Diet is crucial. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people... and. The nice thing about diet is once people sort of really work on their nutrition and clean it up, then their body will give them very acute feedback when they, when they do the wrong thing, you know? So while if they'd eaten gluten every day, they may not be aware of its connection with their brain fog, but if they stay away from it for a few weeks and then go out for dinner or, you know, or eat gluten for whatever reason, then they realize how foggy they are the next day and sugar will do the same thing. I mean, any food that's that's sort of causing an inflammatory effect will will certainly do that, has the potential to do that. Um, I think some brain fog does respond well to neurotransmitter support. So some people do well with tyrosine and things like that to sort of just boost that norepinephrine, epinephrine pathway. Um, But for some people that just makes them anxious. So I mean, my favorite things with that, glutathione certainly is one of the key things for the brain. I use a lot of Smilax, Glabray, because that does cross the blood-brain barrier and that helps to sort of neutralize neurotoxins. And then frankincense, essential oil, a couple of drops under their tongue. Nice. And that works really well too. And since you mentioned the connection with inflammation, I'm guessing coffee enemas potentially. Coffee (laughs) enemas. Of course, coffee (laughs) enemas. So let's talk a little bit of the other issue I think that's so key for people is getting good sleep. I mean, you can't really heal and restore without good sleep. So what can people do to improve their sleep? Maybe some sleep hygiene issues, but what do you find Mm -hmm. helps people in that realm? Definitely sleep hygiene. I mean, it's very important to sort of set, you know, have a routine before bed and have a set schedule and just kind of develop those things. Get the get the phone out, get the iPad out. Don't be sitting watching your iPad, you know, sitting up in bed until you fall asleep kind of thing because that can really mess with the brainwaves. Um, I have found low-dose naltrexone helps a lot of people with sleep. I tend to do a combination of sleep aids in terms of, I don't feel like melatonin alone quite does it. And melatonin is very short acting. So even if it helps people fall asleep, it won't necessarily help them stay asleep. Um, So I like a combination and I mean, we have a sleep support formula that has um, melatonin and 5-HTP and theanine and inositol and passionflower and chamomile and sort of every natural sleep aid known to man is in that thing. So I feel like there are some good natural agents Um, and then, you know, the LDN can be really helpful too. But I also think it's important to correct the adrenal and thyroid imbalances because if Cortisol is spiking at night. That's going to keep people up and interfere with their sleep quality and also interfere with the immune system's ability to sort of do its housekeeping that it does overnight. Um, And thyroid too. If thyroid's low, you wouldn't necessarily think this, but thyroid is metabolic and it can boost people's energy. But if they take that, get their thyroid corrected and take it in the morning, then it can help sleep quality. Very good. Yep. 
The other thing that I found personally was minimizing, and you touched on this with phones and whatnot, but as much as possible, minimizing those EMF exposures. So I sleep in a, you know, silver lined canopy type Faraday cage, and that really, really helps to kind of just (laughs) get rid of all that chatter that the brain can perceive, but that we don't really physically perceive. Let's talk about oxidative therapies a bit. So what is the role of hyperbaric oxygen? And we touched on a little bit, but ozone as well. And do you Mm -hmm. find that those are consistently helpful in Lyme disease? I do. I've always loved hyperbaric oxygen. Um, I have found that the majority of patients that can go through a course of HBOT do well. Um, It's just hard. It's time and money intensive. So it's hard for people to access uh, and so it's just, it's been tough being able to get as many patients into that as I would like. Um, ozone therapy, I think is huge. I love ozone therapy. We've only been doing it the last few months in our practice, but it's really contributed, you know, quite significantly to people's well being. Um, and so I really, yeah, I'm very big fan of that. So now I'm sort of really researching, okay, how can people do this at home? Like what would they need to be able to do rectal ozone or, um, I think actually probably rectal ozone for my research so far is, is going to be the most beneficial as opposed to, you know, drinking ozonated water or, you know, some of the ear insufflations, things like that. Um, because it does have that connection with the portal liver, which helps then with the portal vein, excuse me, which helps with liver detox. Um, so I think it's huge. I think the oxidative therapies are, are great. Yeah. And I've read that um, doing rectal insufflation, for example, that if you do five rectal insufflations, that it's about equivalent to maybe three IV ozones or major autohemotherapy, that it actually is quite effective for something that you can do at home and being able to more consistently do that rather than having to always go to a practitioner's office several times a week is, is I think, a really empowering thing. Absolutely. I fully agree with you there. And I mean, you can get good home sort of ozonate ozone generators for, you know, a few hundred dollars, which isn't nothing, but I mean, all things considered, it's, it's then something that you can have forever. Um, so I think there is a lot of value to that. What about frequency therapy? So anything in the realm of either light photons, pulsed electromagnetic fields, rife, anything there that you found your patients have found helpful? Yeah, so we've, I mean, we've done the pulse electromagnetic frequency, and I, I have found that helpful. I view that more as sort of getting the cells functioning well, rather than actually like killing off the bacteria or the pathogens, where RIFE is more like about killing off the pathogens. So I do think there's a place for that. Um, I do have some patients that, that do RIFE therapy. Uh, I don't, I don't necessarily view that in and of itself, that's going to take care of everything, although people have had that experience. Um, but that's with anything in Lyme treatment. There's, there's never going to be sort of one magic bullet. But I think especially people who were avoiding antibiotics and treating naturally, bringing in some kind of frequency therapy is, is really helpful. So that's going back to what we were saying in the beginning, like, you know, doing the herbs and doing the nutritional and hormonal supplementation and working with the diet and doing the detox therapies at home and, you know, possibly rife therapy and, oxidative therapy is like we don't want to overwhelm people making them think they've got to do 30 different things but i do believe that a combination of these modalities is is gives people the best chance are there any specific tools or devices that you found in this realm that you really like that kind of stand out you know i'd have to say that most people most of my patients that do do rife sort of do it independently um so I'm not like I'm not an expert on the ins and outs yeah. of all the different pieces of equipment. Um, okay. I've certainly liked the Biomat, uh, which is a tool that people would really want to yeah. have at home because it's more an everyday tool. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't. I'm not that familiar with all the different kinds of rife therapy and bioresonance and all that. So let's come back a little bit more to talking about hormones. And you've mentioned this along the way with thyroid, adrenals, sex hormones. So how important is that focus on hormones? Do you find that it's kind of a primary thing? How often do patients need to explore that? And maybe some comments around just hormones in general. Yeah, I mean, I do think it's really important. And I would say I look at that in... 80 to 90% of my patients. Um, And if I don't look at it with somebody, it's probably just that we're so busy doing other stuff that we haven't got there yet. Um, I do think adrenals are sort of the important starting point because 
if the adrenals aren't functioning right, that's going to sort of have repercussions for the thyroid and reproductive hormones. Most people don't realize, but you know, 35 to 50% of reproductive hormones are, are made by the adrenal glands. And our adrenal glands are our stress management centers. So over years of illness, um, they can have taken a big hit. And I find adrenals really respond well to rebuilding tools. Like, I mean, some of the balancing herbs are ashwagandha and rhodiola and things like that. But there's also sort of cortisol building, like licorice root helps to enhance cortisol levels. Um, giving DHEA and pregnenolone as precursors can give the adrenals more raw mat materials. So it can actually, they can produce more hormones. Um, so I do think that looking at adrenals is sort of, key thyroid also because a lot of people have autoimmune you know stuff going on with their thyroid um which has been associated with autoimmune gluten intolerance and i do find ldn low dose naltrexone pretty helpful for all of that but certainly a lot of people feel a lot better on some t3 t4 and i use bioidentical i don't use synthetic thyroid hormone i use bioidentical t3 and t4 from a compounding pharmacy and i've seen a lot of people do a lot better with that so and then men do well with testosterone supplementation. Again, I only do bioidentical, but um, that can be that can make a massive difference for men. So the thyroid issues you were talking about is that getting into the realm of Hashimoto's and and that kind of autoimmune presentation. Right. Right. Yeah, I was surprised in one of the podcasts that I did with Evan Hirsch a while back how he's noticed that specifically when he's treating Bartonella that he's able to really significantly influence Hashimoto's and even get some people eventually kind of off thyroid medication. So I had heard lots of other things like Epstein-Barr and metals and fluoride and all of those things potentially impacting the thyroid. But it's interesting that some of these Lyme and co-infections can also, it seems, have uh, an impact on thyroid function as well. Absolutely. I find that too. But I think it's also, you know, it goes further upstream to the pituitary and the hypothalamus, which is really where it all starts, like up in the brain, sends the signals to the pituitary gland, which sends the signals to the thyroid, the adrenals, the ovaries, the testes. So it would make sense that an infection that can impact the central nervous system is going to dysregulate those hormones too. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the gut. This is another area that it seems to me like five years ago, talking to people with Lyme, not that many people mentioned the gut um, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, specific symptoms that they're having. Now it seems like almost everyone's talking about the gut. So what are some of the microbial issues that impact the gut? How often do you see parasites? How often do you see SIBO, which again, several years ago, I don't think we, I, I ever really heard much about SIBO and now everybody's doing SIBO breath testing and things of that nature. So right. what are the things you see that impact the gut? And then what are some of your favorite tools for kind of booting out the critters and really optimizing GI function? Yeah. So I don't do a lot of SIBO testing. I mean, I know SIBO is sort of the the kind of latest and, and potentially slightly trendy kind of term. I do comprehensive stool analysis. Um, and I love the microbial organic acid test by Great Plains because it has markers of yeast overgrowth, which to me like quantifies a candida issue. You know, that arabinose, which is a metabolite of candida, can be measured in the urine. And if it's, you know, it's meant to be what, less than 30, I think it is. You know, if it's 40, you've got a bit of a problem. If it's 120, you've got a, a big problem. So I love that we actually quantify a candida issue. So SIBO, I mean... I look at the bacterial imbalances on the stool test. I tend not to do the breath test because people have to take this stuff. And I have found that not everybody does well with the stuff that you have to take before doing the test. Um, but it's, you know, I sort of make a little bit of a clinical assumption sometimes. Um, and then some of my antibacterials, I mean, the, the biocidin I like to use, berberine, um, garlic extract, um, even olive leaf extract I've found to be nice for helping sort of balance the microbiome. And then, um, and then looking at leaky gut as well is really important. And I think leaky gut to me is really crucial because so many things put stress on the gut and cause inflammation and then cause, you know, enough irritation that those gut junctions kind of open up. And that's when people start getting very reactive to foods that they may not have been reactive to before because you know, the integrity of the gut lining is compromised, the little spaces in between the cells so that bigger food molecules can get through and then the immune system is going to have a fit because it's not trained that chunks of food are going to, you know, be presented in the bloodstream. So I see that as a big deal and I work a lot on, on trying to correct that. 
So in the realm of leaky gut, have you explored either uh, Zach Bush's Restore product or uh, Kieran Krishnan's Megaspore Biotic? Um, I use the Restore for gut health all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really like it and I feel like it helps people's digestion, but it helps their brain a lot of times too. Uh, I use Ultra Inflamex by Metagenics I like. I've, I've seen good results with that. Nice. Um, they're probably my favorites. And then some people with the glutamine and slippery elm and licorice and, you know, those combinations of kind of gut soothing nutrients, but also gut healers. And how about parasites? Since we're talking about gut, how, how often would you say that is an issue for your patient? And then are there certain things there? I know you mentioned you have a good formulation that you've put together, but let's talk about parasites for a minute. Yeah. I mean, I'm still, I'm sort of still trying to get a a handle on exactly what's going on here because we've always, always thought about these sort of microscopic parasites and you can test for them pretty easily, like the cryptosporidium and blastocystis and entamoeba and those guys. But people are coming back more and more frequently now and saying, you should see what's coming out in my stool. You should see when I do coffee enemas, what's coming out. And, um, and then they have all the pictures on the phone to show you. Oh, yes. And they, <laughs> yeah, and they do. Or they email them. Yeah. My poor friend, I, I don't mind. I, I can talk about people all day long. For, yeah, that's what I do for a living. But my staff are like, I forwarded you some pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I feel like that's kind of emerging as a big issue. I haven't got it all sorted out yet. I'm, I'm certainly doing some, you know, ivermectin pulses and things like that with some of my patients. I'm finding a linea can be helpful even for the more helminth kind of infections, not just the microscopic. Um, coffee enemas are clearing a lot out and it's, it's a little bit tricky to know, is that really like a worm thing or is that a biofilm thing or is that mucus or is it candida related or, you know, kind of what's going on here? Um, I have not jumped on the bandwagon of doing really intensive antiparasitic treatment. I know like Dr. Klinghart type protocols. Um, I'm still a little afraid of that. It just feels like a lot. Um, but I do, you know, certainly the antiparasite herbs in conjunction with coffee enemas, I think can be important, important and doing those biofilm agents just to really try and help break down biofilm in the gut. So you are very well known for your Lyme diet book. I think that was one of your first books, if not your first book first in book. Lyme. Yeah. And, and yeah. still one of the ones that I refer people to all the time. And I think it's probably still, I'm guessing, a very popular book because it's such an important topic. So maybe some thoughts on highlights of things that someone with Lyme should think about from a dietary perspective. And then since you wrote the book, is there anything that now you kind of look back and you learn some new things and you say, you know what, my, my thoughts then are kind of different than they are now you know the foundation is really the same i mean the key is when people say okay in a nutshell you know diet no gluten no sugar no dairy preferably unless it's like some fermented kefir or something like that goat dairy where possible not cow dairy um and then i do think it's important for people to get food sensitivity testing so they know what else is inflammatory for them so some people may react badly to garlic or bananas or cranberries or things that you know other people could eat and things that could be considered quote unquote healthy foods so the foundation of that of the Lyme diet I would say has not changed that much um the only thing I would add is that I have heard of quite a few people doing well with a ketogenic diet um and so that's one thing that I would probably explore a little bit more at this point okay beautiful So we touched on mold earlier in this conversation, and that was actually one of the ones that you said was very important to consider in someone with Lyme. So if someone's getting exposed to mold in their living environment, their work environment, their school environment, how much does that impact their ability to move their recovery forward from Lyme? And is it a common, and is it a common issue that you see in patients or is it like 5%? No, it's more than 5%. I would actually say at this point, it is pretty common. Um, And I think it has massive impact. I mean, when I think back of some, a couple of key patients, like this this gal I worked with in Australia who was so sick, so sick. And we got her to a point of like, she was still sort of 10% away from feeling like her old self again, but something was in the way. We just weren't cracking that last bit. And she discovered she was living in a moldy house. And the hard part about mold is 
you know, then what? Like if somebody, obviously the first thing to look at is current exposure, ongoing exposure. And I've got a couple of patients who know they're living in moldy environments, but they, they just can't figure it out to move. I mean, they're, they're sick. They don't have a lot of money. Um, it's just, it just feels like overwhelming and impossible to get out of the environment. And that's, it is kind of scary because it will, it will no doubt be a limiting factor. So I try to test most of my patients for mycotoxins. I actually am very happy that Great Plains Lab just came out with a new mycotoxin test. Yeah. It doesn't test the gliotoxins that real-time labs tests, um, but it's got numerous other markers and it's like $299, which is a lot better than what's available right now. So that's making that kind of testing more accessible. And I would say, you know, mold testing, heavy metal testing, adrenal testing, hormone testing, that's all kind of within the realm of what I want to get done with folks in the first few months. Yeah, my observation has been that people that are not really recovering with their Lyme treatment, um, especially the people that I connect with here in the California area, that mm -hmm. at least half of them have some mold impact, that there is a piece of the puzzle that's mold. And so right. um, wh whether it's current or they had a big issue in the past, it seems like there's always some part of their history or current experience that is mold. And I would go as far as to say that, you know, as much as I kind of became more known for talking about Lyme, um, having been through significant mold illness twice, I would say that that probably had more impact on my overall recovery than having mm. had the Lyme, actually. I mean, it's a, it's a really, really big deal for a lot of people. So um, message for those listening is if you have Lyme and you're not recovering to the point that you would like explore mold with your practitioner, it is a very, very big thing. And I'm also excited that Great Plains, because they have such a good reputation, I know there was a lot of um, conversation about the usefulness of the other lab that was available. I personally found it helpful when I was struggling with mold again a couple of years ago. Um, but it's nice to see that other labs are also exploring that and kind of making it more available. So I yeah, and I, I mean, I have found their testing very helpful too. Um, and for me, and again, just not, you know, I'm not a mold expert. I'm not a certified shoemaker dog. So all the other markers um, that like a shoemaker doc would run you know, I was less familiar with all the ins and outs of that. So I actually have liked the mycotoxin, the urine mycotoxin test. It was just, um, it was just purely the cost. I thought the test itself was very helpful. It was yeah, just I agree. You know, purely the price tag for folks. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about the impact of mental, emotional stress, um, past conflicts, traumas, those types of things, um, whether they set the stage for us developing a chronic illness because over a long period of time they've affected our adrenals and our immune system, or just the process of kind of going through Lyme disease and oftentimes being invalidated by so many people that that in and of itself creates kind of a trauma that we need to process. And so what are your thoughts on the impact of mental, emotional health in terms of recovery and maybe tools that you found helpful in this realm? Yeah, I mean, I think this is massive too. And I think it's both things that you mentioned. I mean, a lot of people have, you know, history of trauma or emotional stress or relational stress um, that does impact the adrenals. But what I think is interesting is to listen to Annie Hopper talk about the limbic system and the impact of trauma and emotional, you know, issues on the limbic system in the brain, which ultimately regulates so many of our sort of physical functions, including all our hormone regulation and all of that. So I think that's fascinating to kind of see, like just to hear her research on that and how then doing the sort of neural retraining in the limbic system can help not only work through those things, but can help with physical symptoms as well. And I have some folks who've done her program and have had great results with it. Um, so that's one thing I am a supporter of. But I, I absolutely agree with you that, I mean, I, a lot of my patients have PTSD. I mean, it's, it's, there's no other way to say it. It is a, a form of post-traumatic stress disorder that they've had such a rugged experience and such an incredible, like horrific journey. And so I think that it's important to see that and validate that and, and kind of understand that that is such an inherent part of the journey for a lot of people and we have to figure out ways to work through it and move through it because while it's all true that doesn't help today you know what what's important today is 
having a positive outlook on the future, creating those neural pathways. And I love the whole area of neuroplasticity because it really says the thoughts we choose and we repeat, those neural pathways are going to get stronger and thicker. And so you can choose to strengthen negative neural pathways or positive neural pathways. The choice is yours. But, you know, it is a choice. People do have to kind of actively participate in that process because I think human nature would be to be, you know, this is what's happened to me and sort of, I don't want to say a victim stance, that's too strong of a word, but, you know, um, how do I say that gently? Just kind of having, carrying that impact of everything that's happened. Um, And so I think that whatever the tools may be, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or family therapy or, you know, like counseling or EFT is one that I think is very valuable. And again, you know, inexpensive, I mean, free, actually, people can do it at home. It takes, you know, a little bit of time to learn. There's internet, free internet courses to learn how to do the tapping technique. And then they can utilize it all day long at zero cost to help them deal with emotions that can come up along the way. So I'm a big believer in, and Sandy Berenbaum is, I think, kind of a leader in this area. And um, I've talked to her at length about it, but I'm a big believer that it it's helpful if possible to recruit professional help through a, a marriage and family therapist or a counselor or whatever, psychologist, whatever the case may be, to work through some of those issues Um, because I think they can hold people back. I think they do hold people back if they get stuck in the history, they get stuck in the story. You know, I mean, there's, there's two things that happen. There's like what happened. And then there's a story we create around what happened and that what happened is never going to change, but the story we create around it can change. Yeah, I I definitely agree with what you've said. And I've also seen many people that have done um, very well with Annie Hopper system. I had her on a podcast a couple of months ago, and that was a a really interesting conversation. And then I also really like EMDR as well for the eye movement desensitization. I think that's another tool that some people can can really benefit from. But again, similar to the mold piece, if someone with Lyme is not really moving forward, I think we have to explore this. I mean, for me years ago, muscle testing, uh, you know, I'm willing to be well, yes, I'm able to be well, yes, I deserve to be well, I would always get no, even when I muscle Mm. tested myself, I'm like, what's going on, you know, it shouldn't be that way. Um, And it was an important thing to figure out. And I do think a lot of times in Lyme, um, there's kind of a pattern of type A perfectionist personalities. Um, It's rare that I talk to someone who wasn't a type A personality. And Mm -hmm. I think we oftentimes have high expectations for ourselves and we feel like we maybe don't um, always deserve to be well or aren't worthy of Mm -hmm. wellness. I think that's kind of a common theme that I've seen as well. So it it is an important thing for people to explore. Mm -hmm. Um, So thanks for those, those thoughts. Yeah. And I, I would point people to, and I am not actually even going to know the exact association, but it may, I was just thinking of it as you um, brought that up, uh, the Energy Psychology Association, um, because that's a field where you can actually see a practitioner. And, and I've done a couple of years of that work myself, um, seeing an energy psychology practitioner. And I felt like for me anyway, it, it just was so much quicker a process to, to clear some emotional things and, and work and sort of release some things rather than going through the whole process of talk therapy. And I'm not, I'm not saying that there's not value to talk therapy at all. I'm not saying that, but for me, the energy psychology really just helped me to cut through a lot of stuff in a pretty, you know, pretty short period of time. I I definitely agree with that as well, um, which is why I'm smiling, because I think sometimes talk therapy can be good. But on the other hand, I think sometimes talking about a trauma recreates that energetic kind of event that happened as a result of the trauma. So sometimes I think that that talk therapy itself can kind of be traumatizing on some levels. Yeah. Um, And I think too, talk therapy works, you know, I think we need to get to the subconscious or the unconscious level of it. I mean, I can talk about my crap all day long, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, a lot of people are very aware of things, but that doesn't really sort of shift on the really deep levels. And I think that's where energy psychology can come in. We actually, I mean, we've started doing a little bit more energy stuff in my practice, which I've usually been more sort of functional medicine and very integrative, but a couple of my practitioners, you know, are bringing in Reiki and gemstone therapy and, and our patients are raving about those things. So again, just sort of getting some of that energetic balancing 
I think could be really awesome. helpful too. So when you do all the things that we've just talked about and a patient just is not responding to treatment, are there some common reasons that people maybe are held back in terms of their recovery? I would say mold would be number one. I mean, heavy metals to some extent, but I don't see it being as much of a, you know, get in the way factor. Um, and then, you know, looking at gut function, how much are they actually absorbing what we're giving them to try to treat? Um, and then the emotional aspects, whether that's getting in the way. So there's some of the key things that I do look at. Um, I mean, and then obvious things like, are we treating the right co-infection, for example? But I've, I, that's a big, um, it's a big deal to me from the beginning. So I'm always very, very conscious of co-infection treatment all the way along. So what would you say is kind of the eventual outcome or eventual goal for most of your patients with Lyme? Do many of them become asymptomatic? Do they stop treatment completely? Do they stay on some type of maintenance, herbal, antimicrobial? Um, what does living with Lyme long-term look like? Yeah, I mean, some people get to the point where they don't have to do any antimicrobials on an ongoing basis. And I actually still call that the goal, you know, to where they're definitely on a supportive regimen of, you know, multivitamins and essential fatty acids and glutathione. I try and keep people on forever and vitamin D and probiotics and just a really good strengthening regimen. But I always, you know, educate my folks that they do have to be mindful of nutrition on an ongoing basis. They may not always have to be as strict as they, you know, were throughout their Lyme treatment. But they've got to watch their stress levels. They've got to watch their sleep. They've got to watch their nutrition because once they stop paying attention to some of those things, they're putting their bodies, you know, in a more vulnerable state and and kind of not keeping their immune system as as strong as it needs to be. So yeah, I mean, I do have some people that get to symptom free and just sort of go out in their lives and doing their thing. But I do see that there's a possibility that symptoms may flare along the way if you know, in the right environment, like if a big stressor happens or if they do start getting a little bit away from their kind of healthy lifestyle regimen. So, and then there are some people that kind of get to 90% and there are sort of few lingering symptoms, but they're like, you know what, I'll take it. You know, I, I was at 30, now I'm at 90. If this is, if this is the rest of my life, I can live with it. And I, I hear that quite a lot. And, you know, who knows what might be sort of di tissue damage or something from Lyme that may always be a vulnerability for them. And then I think it's also important to remember that not everything is Lyme. I mean, I have a patient right now who's been out playing tennis every day and her knees are hurting. Well, her knees hurting because it's Lyme or her knees hurting because she's playing tennis every day. You know, it's, we don't always know for sure. So I think to some extent, and I talk about this in one of the modules in the course, like there's this sort of, when do you fight, 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 fight? And when do you go, okay, I'm just going to just kind of roll with it for a while, you know, and see how things go over time and, you know, still hopefully pay attention to some of those lifestyle factors, um, but not hit the antimicrobial part as hard. That makes total sense. Let's talk about a few of the things that you've been exploring recently. So I know that um, exogenous ketones was one of the things that you had talked about. Um, CBD oils was another mm -hmm. and then essential oils as well. So are all three of these things still things that you're excited about? What's kind of been the clinical outcome of implementing these with your patients? Yeah, I mean, I think they're all three things that I've seen be very beneficial in, you know, in various individuals. It's not like all, you know, all three are going to be right for everybody. Um, the ketones, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm hearing good things from people who are doing the ketogenic diet. I think exogenous ketones are just a way for the, the rest of us that don't want to do the whole shebang diet to get that sort of a little bit more energy source. So I see people with better energy and, and more clear brain function. And I certainly know for myself, I'm a runner. And when I started taking ketones every day, like all of a sudden, all my runs were easy. You know, it used to be Monday run was easy by Friday. It was a bit hard because I was tired. Um, all my runs were easy. So, I mean, I've seen that kind of physical energy response. Essential oils have played a massive role for me in actually in the antimicrobial capacity. Um, I mean, some of those oils are, are, are very strong antibacterials, antiparasitics. So I've used them not only as support capacity, um, but also as antimicrobial. So, yes, they have been a big part. And even people who aren't doing the antimicrobial protocol can still use them to help calm their belly if their digestion gets upset when they're taking other herbs or taking antibiotics or use some of them topically for pain. I mean, there's just so many different uses. 
Um, and CBD, yeah, I've been researching more recently um, and utilizing hemp oil in my practice, which is, you know, just a legal nutritional supplement. Um, and it's, it's legal in all 50 states, so it doesn't require a prescription or anything like that, like medical marijuana. And um, that's been very helpful for inflammation, but also for anxiety, which is a big deal for a lot of people. So I know people will email me and ask, so I'll just ask you now. So is there a favorite exogenous ketone product that you found helpful? I use the Keto OS, the Prove It Keto OS. Um, I haven't tried too many different ones, but I like that one to me. It tastes good. It's it's worked well for most people. Um, so that's, that's the one. And, and how about the hemp oil? Uh, the company there is Prime My Body. It's a liposomal hemp oil. So um, the important thing, and this is why I love the liposomal glutathione and liposomal vitamin C. I mean, the liposomal formulation has such a superior absorption to other, other sort of liquids. Um, and so I think that's, that's one that I found to have a lot better effect. And that's the one that was uh, formulated by Chris Shade, who we all know from Quicksilver Scientific and lots of other great products as well. Right. Yeah. So I think the things that we covered today really are just kind of the tip of the iceberg in terms of the course that you've created, mm -hmm. actually several courses that you've created. So maybe you could tell us a little about the different courses that you've made available. And if sure. people are interested in exploring those, what can they expect to learn? Yeah, absolutely. So I've developed the, the main program is called Lime Ed and it's 10 modules. Uh, it's about 23 hours of teaching. So it's effectively every single thing I know about Lime in a recorded format. So it's it, the slides, you get notes of every lesson within every module. And then there's some really cool how to guides too. I mean, there's, there's a guide of how to make kefir, how to make kombucha, how to do coffee enemas, how to do baths, how to do dry skin brushing, like practical kind of guides that, that give people the, the practical information. So there's 10 modules, everything from the antibiotic treatment of Lyme, um, living with Lyme long-term and just exploring that, some of the energy um, kind of things like the EFT. And there's a whole two-hour module on detoxification, what it is, why it's so important, how to do it. Um, there's a two-hour module on naturopathic treatments. There's a nutrition module. Um, there's a whole module on digestive issues. There's a whole module on hormone issues. So the whole program is the 10 modules put together and then um, a couple of bonus lectures too about CBD and about essential oils. Um, but I have made those modules um, available individually as well. So if somebody has a specific interest in learning the nutrition piece or really needs help on their detoxification, then they can just access the single modules that will help them in that area. Beautiful. Yeah, I think the idea of this course is fantastic. I've actually been working through it myself and finding it um, tremendously helpful with lots and lots of information. I mean, the idea that we can actually, you know, get someone who's been treating people um, for years and has a ton of experience around Lyme and just learn from your experience. I mean, I can't imagine what that would have meant to me 20 years ago when I first got uh, exposed to Lyme. I mean, that would have just been so invaluable. So I think that it's a, a fantastic tool and I appreciate you making it available to us. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, and I've really done my best to sort of break it down into modules and then within modules, it's broken down into lessons. Um, and if somebody were to purchase a course, they have lifetime access so they can keep going back and listen to things because I think what's relevant to you changes too as you progress, you know, along, along the line. There's even things like, you know, what, what does it mean when antibiotics stop working? What can you do if antibiotics stop working? And, you know, just lots of sort of practical information like that. So if people are interested in potentially working with you as a practitioner, are you taking new patients? And maybe you could tell us how they can connect with your office. Yeah, so I, I am officially taking new patients. It's, it's kind of a wait, um, but I am officially open to new patients. And so the best way is just to call the office and the number there is 619-546-546. 4065 or contact us through the website at restoremedicine.com. And then um, for the Lyme course and the modules, the website is lyme-ed.com. Beautiful, beautiful. So what are some of the key things that you do on a daily basis in support of your own health? Yeah, great question. So um I exercise five days a week. I run. Um, and that's really important, not only for my physical health, but my mental health too. I'm a nicer gal all day long if I've run in the morning. Um, 
but I'm, I'm, I do some detox stuff every day. Like I get up in the morning, I do my shot of glutathione then I, you know, go away for 10 minutes and I come back and I do some apple cider vinegar with some essential oils in it. Um, then I do a greens powder. Um, so I'm absolutely gluten free and sugar free. Um, and you know, I like my one coffee in the morning and I, I love my red wine with my dinner, but I don't do any sweets or, or really any grains at all. And so I feel like that helps me with my energy. And so I have to ask, do you take your morning coffee orally? I just couldn't couldn't resist that one. So yeah, yeah, yeah. With the stevia in it too. So So yeah, I mean a lot for me is diet. I go in and out with supplements, but you know, by the grace of God, I I enjoy really good health. So um, most of what I do is just diet and lifestyle. I'm in bed by 10 o'clock every night. I love to be up early and enjoy the morning, the morning. So Beautiful. Yeah, this has been so fun. I think we uh, touched on so many important topics. I think you've shared some great tools and things that people can really go off and start implementing. Um, the idea that the course is available to people is is really empowering. I certainly encourage people to go check it out because I think you put so, I know how much time you put into it, right? You've been, right. been working on this course for a long time. <laughs> so um, I think it's really a fantastic tool. You've been doing this for a long time and I just uh, really appreciate all that you do, the information that you share and just being another uh, brave practitioner that are really out there helping people on the front lines getting well from Lyme disease. So thank you. Yeah, Yeah, you're so welcome. Yeah, it's been great having you on the show today. I look forward to talking with you again soon. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. Thanks. To learn more about today's guest, visit RestoreMedicine.com. That's Restore, R-E-S-T-O-R, Medicine.com. To learn more about the courses that have been discussed in this podcast, visit BetterHealthGuy.link forward slash Lyme Courses. That's BetterHealthGuy.link forward slash Lyme Courses. I appreciate your support of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter as Better Health Guy. The show can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. If you'd like to support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. And if you'd like to be added to my newsletter, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. I'm looking forward to many more shows ahead and appreciate your interest. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit betterhealthguy.com.